Uh, joining us now, Jeff Charlotte. He is a professor of English at Dartmouth College, author of his most recent, The Undertow, Scenes from a Slow a Civil War. I think this is like your fifth or sixth book, if I, uh, 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 off the top of my head, Jeff. So congratulations. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Sam. Good to be with you again. Um, so, all right. This is, this is a really interesting uh, book, and, and, and obviously um, the, the, the subtitle, Scenes, Scenes from a Slow Civil War, uh, is sort of the spoiler alert, maybe. <laughs> uh, let's hope not. But um, it's interesting because it really did remind me of, the, we should say, like, this is a series of essays that really cover the past 10 years or so, more or less, um, and uh, sort of a, our, the, the slow... Uh, degradation of our uh, of our of our union on some level. Also intertwined in this is your sort of your personal journey, and it there was something that reminded me of uh, of of Sherman's March that Ma Ross McElwee a documentary. I, I don't know if you ever uh, saw yeah. that, but that was a a seminal movie for me uh, back in uh, my earlier uh, life, and. Um, and there, and there is a quality of that, except for um, this one sort of details. This is like almost like your own Sherman's march on some level. Like there's Sherman's on the march again uh, on some level, but in reverse uh, almost. Uh, but let, let's let's just start with the idea of defining fascism, because yeah. this book is sort of like Marx's a slight change in your perspective or a significant change in your perspective as to its, its presence in this country. Yeah. And thanks, Sam. And thanks for, for, for citing Sherman's March, which is a movie formative for me too. And I feel like we should say to viewers, especially Southern, there's um, it, it's, it's a sort of a first person narrative of a guy going and sort of reviewing all his failed relationships, which is not what this book is about because times have changed. It may, or maybe it is. It's about reviewing, our failed relationships as a nation. Um, and and I think obviously the most failed relationship is fascism. Uh, I, I've been writing about right-wing movements uh, of various varieties in the United States and abroad for about 20 years. And for a long time, I actually resisted the use of the word fascist as many on the left and, and liberals use. I said, there's more than one kind of bad under the sun. That was no kind of defense of say the first Bush administration or denial that there aren't pockets and communities that experienced fascism in the United States, but we didn't have that government. And in fact, in my 2008 book, The Family, which is about a fundamentalist group, and, uh, I said, and, and these were guys who actually after World War II went and recorded, uh, recruited Nazi war criminals. I called it the F word, fascism. And I said, I don't think it's actually possible in America because of fundamentalism, because American fundamentalism, Christian nationalists will never switch out the father, God, for a Fuhrer, a person on earth. And that's what fascism is, a cult of personality. I was wrong. I, I realized when I attended my very, I, I realized when Trump came down that golden escalator, oh, I think they're gonna do this. The fascism that American fundamentalism has supported abroad has come home. And that now, fascism just doesn't mean bad and authoritarian. Fascism means a cult of personality. It doesn't just mean violent, it means a kind of reverence and celebration of violence, the idea of regeneration through violence and a pleasure in violence. Um, it doesn't just mean nationalism, it means invoking a kind of mythic past. Uh, it's a utopian project. Um, it is a dream politics, a nightmare politics, um, and it is always about an enemy within. And the United States right has always other various groups, but it hasn't been quite as fully organized and openly organized around the enemy within, around a cult of personality, the reverence for violence as it is now. And I think we have crossed over into a time when I and other very cautious academic scholars, uh, uh, historians of fascism say, who had reservations at first say, yes, we are now dealing with an American fascism. What is the fascism without that cult of personality? I mean, because, you know, the thing that's, you know, uh, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it seems so uh, like it's, it's hard to sort of parse out like theocracy, like what, like what happens if Donald Trump, because we're, when we talk about cult of personality, we're talking about Donald Trump. Um, and um, it is almost as if like all of these things, 
were and in fact this is what i was saying when he came down that escalator on that very night um was the the suit has been tailored and this guy just fits mm. so what what is left if the guy exits the suit but the suit's still there right like, i mean that's that the, 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 the all the other stuff is not going away. So, like, where does that leave us? I mean, because much of it is driven by some type of fundamentalism, although not it, it, it it's a it's a self identified fundamentalism, but it's not it does not like sort of like adhere to the precepts of what we would constitute Christian fundamentalism. Per oh, se. well, it does. It does. And I think that's one of the things people say, well, Trump's not very pious. And this is something I understood from spending a long time writing on the Christian right. They've long understood. Um, and this is they've, going back to the Bible, uh, where there's a figure called King Cyrus, to whom Trump and the Christian right is, is frequently compared. Uh, King Cyrus is a Gentile, but he is used by God. God can use any tool. Uh, in fact, some Christian right leaders called Trump in, in 2016 God's chaos candidate. They called him a wrecking ball. But um, the point was to sort of smash these, <laughs> smash some walls and build some others, right? Um, smash the wall of separation of church and state, which he did. This is by far and away more than Reagan, more than any Bush, the most successful. That was the most successful time for Christian right. And none of that goes away. That becomes part of institutions. But I think of, you know, the suit's been tailored, right? I think of a, a, a pastor I met in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I went to a, a small mega church, like- uh, This is Pastor Hank. Hank Kuhneman, uh, 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 something of a rising star in the prophetic Christian right, a guy who regularly appears with Lauren Boebert and, and General Michael Flynn, uh, has a church with its own kind of militia, as more and more churches do. He believes that churches should be arming up for war, he believes civil war is coming. And he says, of course, Trump is coming back, but he makes he makes a distinction. He says, Trump is coming back. Maybe the man himself, or maybe the spirit clothed in the flesh of another. It's the spirit of Trumpism. And I think this is something we learn from history in fascist movements. Trumpism is the threat. Trump may be the avatar of it. Maybe Ron DeSantis will be the avatar of it. There are avatars of it. There's avatars right here where I am. I'm in New Hampshire and uh, a, a, a right wing family doing my, my children's school, trying to get a list of queer kids. Um, that's the spirit of Trumpism let loose in the land. And I think, I think it's what frustrates me so much about the old school political horse race reporting. This focus on Trump versus DeSantis, that's not the issue. It's mm -hmm. focused on, well, maybe Trump's defeated and we're back to normal now. Right. We're, we're in the Trump scene now. We're in the tr age of Trump. And that means the struggle is going to be a long one. Can, can you elaborate on the point about how uh, his movement is still very connected to an evangelical Christian right line of thought? Because I returned to, I believe it was The Atlantic, profiling Mike Pence before the election about how a guy like him could support a guy like Trump. And really it comes down to, you know, Trump being an imperfect vessel, but he's uh, implementing God's grace by appointing these judges. Right. But like, it's more than just the political strategy of it. It's also, I feel as Sam was alluding to, it colors the way that his followers behave politically. I would also argue. Yeah, I think Mike Pence, of all people, should understand this best. Um, I'm, I, I'm not a political pundit. I don't make predictions. Um, but in one instance, uh, uh, I, I, I was almost prescient. My 2010 book, C Street, which was also about this group of the family, this sort of, uh, they're the folks who organize a national prayer breakfast, of which Mike Pence was part. And at the end of the book, noting that a number of their members had fallen to various sex scandals, I said, you know, so none of these guys are going to the White House, but maybe in 2016, it'll be a little known Indiana congressman named Mike Pence. What well, was Cooks, right? Um, and Pence is, he should understand why, though, he doesn't necessarily win the big prize. Pence, for instance, was instrumental through that organization in arranging arms for uh, the Sri Lankan government to commit really almost genocidal crimes against its own citizens. This is not a Christian government, um, but he believed that they were a means to an end. And I think there's there's a way that secularism has a kind of naivete about 
Christian nationalism as if we imagine that they're somehow less savvy, less canny than the rest of us, that they don't understand that there are tools. Um, not only do they understand there are tools, the Bible is all about that, about God using imperfect men. This group, for instance, teaches King David. And I've heard, I've heard um, Trump compared to King David, too. Uh, King David, we know, you know, he kills Goliath uh, with the uh, sling, but he goes on to become kind of an awful man uh, who, who uh, rapes his, his lead general's wife and arranges for his general to be killed. Christians know that. And that's what they understand, that this is, this is the equivalent of Trump saying, I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, or this idea that somehow we're going to take Ron DeSantis down by proving that he was present for force feeding in Guantanamo. They understand the brutality, and, and they've made their deal with it. What, what makes what's happening, and then I want to, I want to get into some of the specific things. Um, what, what makes what's happening fascist, versus Christian nationalist, let's say. And does it does it does it matter? <laughs> like, I mean, like like I wonder, like, I mean, does it matter in terms of or or does it matter? And if so, how how does it matter in terms of the way we respond and in terms of the way we assess? I believe it does. Uh, Christian nationalist is the term we're using now. We've used the Christian right. We could use American fundamentalism. These terms mutate and change. Um, and there's a case to be made for them and against them. What happens in a fascist moment is the same as I believe happens in any social movement. And I think, again, many on the left believe social movement, that, that, that's our term, right? No, you can have a good social movement or a bad one. The current fascist moment is a social movement. And what's interesting to me, reporting on the right so long, is to see so many factions of the right, long in conflict with each other, converging. Christian nationalism is one of them. Um, a a right-wing libertarianism is one of them. Right-wing Catholicism, which is certainly not evangelicalism, is one of them. Um, it's kind of proud boy culture, which pulls on Christian nationalism, but is obviously something else. It's sort of like proud misogyny. That's one of them. This, the same old corporate right, big business, uh, Elon Musk, all these things converging. That's when you get that's when you get a big, strong current. That's when you get this undertow. And I think it's also critical to make that distinction because the frightening moment we're in now is not one of American exceptionalism. Uh, we have the Trump of America. Brazil just got rid of its Trump of Brazil, but he may not be gone for long. Erdogan in Turkey is called the Trump of Turkey. There is a Buddhist monk, a genocidal Buddhist monk in Myanmar who calls himself the Trump of Myanmar. There's Putin. There's she. We live in a moment. Orban. Orban, a global fascist ascendancy. Uh, you know, I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, and it's certainly not all Christian, right? And so what is drawing these forces together? That, I think, we look at this larger umbrella word fascism. And we understand that the fascism of today is not the fascism of 1935. It's descended from it. Well, let, and let, let's, I mean, just talk, uh, I'll, I'll also talk about the, the circumstances, which is sort of different, right? I mean, the, the, at least in the context of, of 1935, what we're looking at is a, um, is a country that had been, uh, destroyed. Uh, I mean, a, a, a national psyche that had been destroyed in world war one, they had been humiliated uh, in, in the, in the, in the post-World War One, um, you know, sort of new order as it were. And there was also material deprivation. Uh, we don't really have those things. And but, uh, I, I mean, or do we? We do. We do. I believe we do. I think it's also worth remembering that we pay most attention to Germany, not as much to Italy where fascism begins or, well, fascism takes power. Fascism begins in 19th century France, um, uh, which is also a, a different uh, mode. And fascism ripples, you know, there's a great historian, Robert O. Paxton, The Anatomy of Fascism, and he looks at the ways in which fascism did or did not take hold or gained ground. Ireland, for instance, had a significant fascist movement. Um, Rachel Maddox's great recent program, uh, Ultras, uh, introduces us to uh, the American fascist movement, which didn't win, but, um, you know, it was a contender. 
Um, so I think though the 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 change has to do with there's all we also of course didn't have social media then, right? So uh, what would our fascism look like? Uh, we didn't have nearly as many guns then. Um, we have now 393 million guns, at least, in civilian hands in the United States. Um, uh, more guns than there are people. Uh, we had nothing like that at that time. Um, we didn't have the same, we've built up a tradition going back to the Vietnam War, uh, as Kathleen Ballou writes in her great book, uh, Bringing the War Home. This is what I'm going to do. I go on radio shows and I recommend other people. Oh, uh, we've, had, we've had we've uh, had Catherine on yeah. uh, to talk it's about great. that, actually. Yeah, terrific book and about, you know, the ways in which those wars give rise to a militia movement in America. But we also have, um, we have both, uh, we have the immediate moment. You know, we speak of the crisis of democracy. We speak of the crisis of climate. And in the book, I kind of reject this language. I think crisis is... Crisis is this kind of narrative language. It's 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 movie language. It's why I write a lot about movies in the book. It's going to come to a head. The final battle, as Trump said this weekend in Waco, and and Waco. Uh, rather, it's our condition. We live, for instance, in a state of climate grief. And you could say, well, these guys who are are, are joining fascism, they don't believe in that. Tell me about the man, and I see this all over the country as I drive around, who rigs up his truck so that it doesn't just put out the normal amount of exhaust. It puts these special big pipes. It's rolling it's coal. Rolling coal, extra exhaust. I think about this, here's a really strange analogy for understanding that. Um, uh, they used Yiddish, the language of Eastern European Jews. There used to be a lot of Yiddish an anarchists. So they were atheists. And on, on Yom Kippur every year, they would have a feast. You're not supposed to eat, so they would have a feast. You're not supposed to eat pork, so they would have a pig roast. This was a way of saying, see God, see how much I don't believe in you. Same thing with rolling coal. See how much I don't believe in the way that if I live in the West, I'm beset by fire. If I live here in Vermont, we have floods the way that we haven't seen in forever, the way that the land is changing all around me the way that the economy is changing all around me. Just because you don't want to acknowledge it doesn't mean it's not happening. Just because you can't name it doesn't mean you're not grieving it. I think of all the militia churches I visited as I was going around the country. They all talk about the weather because the weather is strange and they know it. But instead of naming it climate change, they name it part of some of God's plan. But they're still scared. They're still in this moment of crisis what's going to happen. They know the Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake is drying up. The Colorado River is drying up. The people who are out there know that. They may believe it's God, they may believe it's Jewish space lasers, um, but they know something's changing and they're scared. And for some of them, the prescription, the solution is this kind of iron, ecstatic iron fist, um, the joy of fascism, which is how they experience it. It's, I mean, it's just a it's a it's a method of of empowering themselves in the face of either sort of like these things that are happening, they have no control over. And we could ex expand upon, you know, the, the weather we can talk about. I mean, there has been a, um, a for the first time in um, a century, really, uh, a, uh, a de decrease in the life expectancy of a lot of uh, these people in particular, you know, white, white men um, well, at well, a certain age. This would have gotten as much speed. I mean, I think one of the important things about the book is I talk about Trump, but most of the book takes place after Trump. The acceleration happens after Trump, after Trump's term and after COVID. And again, people who don't believe in COVID, there's a, you know, a million plus dead in America, many, many, many more sick and lost and, and many in those difficult places. It's grief without mourning, right? If you don't mourn, that grief curdles and it can curdle into anger or hate. Yeah, I, I've been shocked, really, frankly, after the 22 election, even, I thought, like, okay, the um, the, the Republican sort of uh, boogie person of trans uh, people is going to go away because <clears throat> they got defeated electorally on those terms. 
and the complete opposite i was completely blindsided by it frankly it, 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 the complete opposite took place the acceleration of anti-trans uh fervor legislation um uh has it, it, i i i'm I, i've never seen anything like the way that it is responding completely the opposite. Like, you know, even like after what it was, the maybe the 20, 2012 or, or maybe it was 2010 or 2000. I can't remember when the big Republican autopsy was about immigration. At least it was like three or four or five months where, uh, you know, even the worst of them, even like Hannity was like, we've got to really contemplate this and maybe have a reckoning. And then it sort of drifted away uh, over time. But this was like, Weeks after the election, it, it was almost like a just a, a, a switch went off and this sort of like turbo version of anti-trans legislation spread across the country, uh, like head spinning. Um, and it, 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 there does feel like there's some type of accelerant that is in the wake of Trump. You know, we're now approaching something like 20 states uh, that are to some degree or not. Uh, criminalizing trans healthcare, which is to say criminalizing trans people. We have, uh, listeners probably know, uh, uh, the recent CPAC conference, uh, a big applause line for eradication. He, he made this this eradication of transgenderism. He says, I'm not talking about killing the people. Right. Meanwhile, we have all over the country, including around here, uh, uh, groups demanding lists of kids who uh, uh, attend uh, gay straight alliances in their school list. When other when other times in history, and I say it'll never happen here. Who could have imagined we'd get to this point? To those who say, "Oh, civil war," that's that rhetoric is too much. I have two answers. One, I've been driving around the country for the last. I, I would have said that before that too, but I've been driving around the country the last two years. I don't. It's not even a question anymore. I say civil war to folks, and the answer is always yes. It's just when and whether they're looking forward to it. I would argue there's already casualties. Uh, the final, the, the second to last chapter, the penultimate chapter of the book, I drive around Wisconsin after um, the fall of Roe. Wisconsin became the only blue state to, it reverted to 1849 law, the only blue state to completely outlaw abortion. And uh, I was in Wisconsin with my own child. I write about this uh, with their permission. My 13 year old, who is a queer non-binary kid, who is suffering uh, like so many kids are now, um, mental health struggles. And how do I tell my kid not to be paranoid, how not to be afraid when half the country is passing laws against them? When when schools, their schools is, is holding strong, but schools around us are in New Hampshire are taking down every rainbow, whether or not it has to do with pride for fear, when there's a hotline in which you can report teachers. And when they look at, they read the news. My kid follows the news. They hear about women bleeding out because they don't have access to reproductive rights. These are casualties. These are casualties of the slow civil war. I think the trans, the attack on trans is going to escalate. I will say I don't think it stops there. And I think, you know, if we look at Trump, just the Trump era alone, right? 2016, he comes in with a Muslim ban and he moves to undocumented folks. And then he adds trans folks. He never drops any, he adds. Um, all along, there's the media, there's there, there's us, because we're the perfect enemy within, because we, we look like anybody else. We, you know, your own child could be a journalist, you never know. Right. Um, but, uh, and of course, the rising, rising tide of anti-Semitism, which I don't think enough is spoken, um, and all the rising tide of anti-Asian hate, they're adding. And I think there's still some liberal folks who make this mistake it's the oldest mistake, right? They say, oh, it's just terrible what's happening to those people, right? It's terrible what they're doing to trans people. There's some good hearted people that says, well, it's not my place because I'm not on the front lines. You're alive, you're on the front lines. Um, uh, fascism, that's what fascism is. It's a cult of innocence that thrives on death. Um, it's coming for everybody. It comes for fascists themselves. Uh, no one will be protected. I think about around here, and we're close to the Canadian border, so uh, the Border Patrol started putting up uh, checks on the highway, maybe further away than they were legally allowed to. And I looked at all the white folks, the white American citizens, indignant 
right wingers indignant, outraged that they were being forced to wait on the highway. Well, of course they were. Did they think this authoritarianism was going to somehow set them free? It won't. It comes for everyone. And uh, with trans folks and trans kids, I think that's that's a, another old labor song. Which side are you on? Florence Reese from you know, Striking Miners in Kentucky. Uh, that's a which side are you on moment. And the folks who say it's complicated, do you stand with the men who have AR-15s outside of schools, hospitals, libraries, or do you stand with the defenders? Uh, there's an analogy too with, with just Trump uh, personally in terms of like you know those around him. Uh, he'll eventually eat all of them uh, and, and and bring in mm -hmm. new people. I mean that's basically um, what's happening. So g give us a sense of what like um, the I, I, you're you're not using civil war as a metaphor, <laughs> and, and so like, give it give us a sense of like wh how you think this manifests itself if uh, and 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 or a sense of how the people you spoke to, and we should say like, you know, and, and, and then I want to get to Ashley Babbitt too, um, the, which the, the sort of where the title of the book comes from. But, um, as you're talking to all these people, um, and, and it's almost an ethnography on some level, uh, um, as you're talking to all these people, what are they, wh what do you glean from them as to what a civil war could look like? I think they're, what they think a civil war looks like is imaginary, right? Um, uh, just there's a, a new excerpt up from the book uh, uh, up on Vanity Fair today, The Guns Are What Matters, right? And um, there I was in Rifle, Colorado, the aptly named Rifle, Colorado, at Warren Bobert's Shooter's Grill, which is like Hooters, but with guns, uh, waitresses and cutoffs and carrying giant sidearms. And... Um, uh, I ended up having a lunch. Um, I mean, it's all sort of kitsch. Fascism is kitsch, and I think that also confuses people. They think it's silly and funny, and therefore it doesn't matter. So I had a guac nine hamburger. Get it? Guacamole. Mm -hmm. uh, or as they call it there, guacamole. Um, I had a guac nine hamburger with a, a, a militia man. And on the one hand, here's the good news, right? This guy is well armed, um, and he kept saying, we're going to rise up. We're going to rise up when they come for our guns. Well, first of all, um, the Biden administration, I don't think any American government is going to come and take all the guns. Um, that's not going to happen. So great. Meanwhile, this guy believes that Democrats are actually eating children. Well, if that's not enough to get you in the streets, maybe you're not coming out. I don't think. Uh, and with and we should just say literally thinks that Democrats are eating children. Like uh, that, yeah. the, like, like top leadership is eating. He's full like QAnon, Pizzagate, uh, whatever yeah. that uh, uh, sort of. And he's not mentally ill and he's not stupid either. And those beliefs are common. And I almost guarantee you wherever you are, you may not know it. It may not have come up in conversation. You know, people, you may even have friends who hold these beliefs. Um, in. In Wisconsin, Marinette, Wisconsin, I spent some time in the home of a leader of a militia, fairly large militia, militia, an arsenal of guns. And he says, and that's only, you know, only the legal stuff. Um, and he was a J6er. He had was streaming footage on his TV of that his own footage he'd taken at J6. Um, uh, when does the Civil War start? He says, when the feds kick in his door. Um, but what does he imagine? These are guys who've seen Red Dawn one too many times. Right. To say one time, um, <laughs> uh, um, they imagine you know up in the hills. They imagine this heroic resistance. Some of this, I'll say, is on the left too. Uh, I hear leftists saying, "I'm not afraid of these guys because we're arming up the John Brown Gun Club." Or I hear liberals say, "Well, these militias are in for a surprise when uh, an F-16 comes." Um, and yet, I think maybe one of the most important and overlooked pieces of opinion journalism recently was in the Washington Post, three retired generals speaking to the fault lines within the military. And this is something I've reported on fairly extensively for previous books. Um, uh, it, it, where is the situation? The militia is not gonna come marching. There's not gonna be Red Dawn in New York that, or that movie, you know, Texas Invades Bushwick. That's not happening. Um, uh, all these things are sparks. 
That's why it's a slow civil war, as the real civil war, by the way, was a slow civil war for a long time before it became a hot one. It may never blow up. Nothing is inevitable. Inevitability is, a, is the politics of fascism, or it may become something like Northern Ireland, or we may get a spark where a base commander doesn't know who's really president. Do I believe Trump is president or do I believe Biden is president? Whose orders do I commit, do I follow? Um, uh, there's enough base commanders and I've met them and interviewed them, senior officers who are full QAnon kind of folks um, uh, for that to become a very volatile situation. The chain of command in, in America is actually quite strong. That's good news. Um, but what if you don't know where the command is? Then we're looking at something far more terrifying. I don't think it'll happen. I don't think it'll happen. Um, but not because the center will hold. The center hasn't held. I think because we're going to slowly organize our way into something better. But we're going to have to go through a lot of that stuff first. Do you think it's generational? I mean, when you went around, um, uh, you know, and at one point you, 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 early in the book, you talk about Occupy, um, yeah. and um, you, your critique is is one that I think you know people have heard contemporaneously that it wasn't necessarily um, uh, organized for a specific ask. Oh, that's um, not. Oh, no, no, I thought that was the genius of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I, yeah. I, I, I note that. Um, so Occupy. I mean, Occupy. I put Occupy at the beginning. The, the book begins and ends with some hope. Right. Some yes. That I was going to say. I was like, I couldn't, you know, I, just, I couldn't stand <laughs> it. It did it, sort right? of feel like you didn't want to do it. Like, like yeah. yeah. But also because I think it begins actually with uh, Occupy and with Harry Belafonte. And and like, I know this is going to cost me book sales. People are like, oh, look, I got this book and it's all about this art, hor horrible time. I'm like, wait a minute, Harry Belafonte, the banana boat guy? Um, and the reason I put him there, I couldn't stand to start with some of the ugliness, but also um, because I want people to remember this is a long struggle. Occupy seems like a thousand years ago now, you know, when uh, it seemed like we might be on the verge of a real left shift. And remember, Occupy, as you were about to say, they famously didn't have demands and that drove a lot of people uh, just crazy. I thought it was brilliant. And I thought it was imagination. And right now we live in a moment where the right has, I hate to say this, more political imagination than we do. Imagination is another word like social movement. Traveling around the country, it's almost like fascist Americana folk art. I have a friend who's a Smithsonian curator. He says, we've got to collect this stuff. They are painting silos, billboards, a uh, 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 hundred different flags, 200 different flags. Um, Occupy. And artists like Harry Belfonte, who's a radical artist, the Banana Boat song, he understood that as a subversive song. The civil rights movement, he bankrolled it. It wouldn't be there almost without him. And he knows that they failed and Occupy failed. Uh, they were defeated. That's not meant to depress us. That's meant to remind us that the struggle is long, that it's not a crisis. It's not the final battle. We will lose. And we keep going um, and we need to do, do so uh, with imagination and with a diagnosis that I do think is rooted in history. Harry Belafonte suggests that the way we can understand American history and race and American history is through the Minstrel Act, white men corking up, blackface. And he goes further and says there's ways in which we all do a Minstrel Act in America, that this infection of whiteness. I don't mean white people. I'm a white person. I'm a person who is white, um, but whiteness, white supremacy, uh, just that's part of the undertow. And that's pulling people who would not otherwise be a part of this thing into fascism. So yeah, I think it's important to start there. Well, do you think, do you think, I mean, as you, as you travel across the country, do you think there is a, um, there's reason to believe that a lot of this is, um, generational generation yeah. um because you know i'm looking at i mean there's there was a, a poll by the wall street journal uh and um conducted with uh nork i don't know what nork is but uh at the it's a a research thing at uh at university of chicago and the 
the the the numbers on like patriotism and the numbers on religion from 98 to 23, particularly even in the past four years, like COVID really did a number on a lot of different things um, are precipitous. 62% uh, said religion was very important to them in 98 and to, and to 39% say that now. And you can, uh, I mean, uh, in addition to there being some like, obviously, uh, Democratic and Republican split. Um, there's also, it's really like an age. There's a, a big age component to this. And I wonder if, you know, what we aren't seeing is sort of the white knuckle stage mm. of a lot of these things. Um, I'm, being, I'm, 50, I'm 50 and I heard that when I was 20, when I was protesting the Gulf War, when I was uh when, when the first time I was arrested for protesting the Gulf War, the old Quakers said, well, there won't be something like this in your future because your generation is going to change it. My parents heard the same thing. Before. Our generation, though, like, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, but um, I, I, I looked around and it was like, you know, Reagan and yeah. uh, P.J. Yeah. O'Rourke was popular. I mean, it, yeah, it yeah, looked yeah. pretty bleak to me. Oh, man, you guys are the worst. <laughs> We're about the same, the same back, but yeah, the eighties are the worst. But I think, all right, there's a couple of things there, and I think those one, I think those, I'm going to say up front, I think those numbers are some of the most dangerous numbers in America because that story is one we've been taught, and and that America is is getting more diverse. You know what else is getting more diverse? Fascism. The mm -hmm. the, the militia churches I go to are far more diverse than the liberal churches I go to. Um, uh, uh, Trump gets this. Every rally starts with a black or brown preacher a far, far right black or brown preacher. The crowd is mostly, but not all white. Sunrise, Florida, I write about in the book. That that crowd, I don't know, maybe half white. A lot of Cubans, yes, but also a lot of Nicaraguans, a lot of Venezuelans. Uh, the Latinx boom for Trump was very real and it's not subsiding. The, the increase amongst black voters is not a boom, but it's real and it's significant. Um, so that's not going to save us. The young are not going to save us. I talked to some old people, but I start this story of, of the Ashley Babbitt story, who, by the way, is only 35, uh, in Sacramento, California at a rally, and um, which is for Ashley Babbitt, which is really a brawl between Proud Boys. Proud Boys are young. Um, the Proud right. Boys are young. The hipsters in New York, the so-called Dime Square scene, you know, the alt-right of New York. These are young artists. Um, there's youth everywhere but the number one reason why these numbers are wrong and why they seduce liberals and left folks into inaction is that no fascist movement has ever gained power through majority control so if you're waiting for this majority report if you're waiting for the majority to save you you're going to get swept out. I'm not going to work that metaphor. You really are going to get swept out. Well, I, no social movement has needed a majority, really, it seems to me, to succeed. You know, uh, the civil rights movement was not about the right. the majority of Americans by any stretch of the imagination. It's And, and when Harry Belfonte, 19, uh, 1960s, he married a white woman. And they because he was such a star, people don't realize that he was bigger than Elvis. He was such a star. Everyone was entitled to have an opinion on that. 96% of white Americans, many of them presumably who supported the civil rights movement because not 96% of white Americans were opposed to it. 96% of white Americans thought that it was wrong for him to marry a white woman, right? Um, and yet we did, we did break down those laws, those so-called miscegenation laws. They didn't do it with a majority. And fascism isn't trying to do it with the majority either. That's why the three percenters are called the three percenters. They believe that they can take back the country, as they put it, with uh, a very militant, very armed three percent. That's well, not well, the Republicans. Yeah, the Republicans in general are a minoritarian party, but the fascist strain with strain within them, they're the most vocal, but yeah. they're even smaller than that. And I just want to return to what you were saying about the the younger maybe fascist uh movement being a little bit more multicultural the the through line though still seems to be that you know if proud boys are beating people up and they're on the younger side it's also still a very misogynistic movement and male tilted so that's what is yeah. i think a, a through line and it also connects with the new right online irony laden 
completely um, filled with just uh, many degrees of separation from humanity, <laughs> irony. I said irony already, but you know what I mean. Like, that's yeah. kind of the new flavor that it's taking on. Yeah, I think I think this is also sort of where I'm using that metaphor of the undertow, which I encountered on Christian radio as I was driving up into the Colorado mountains. But um, uh, it's a little bit like I take someone like Ashley Babbitt, 35 year old white woman, um, uh, had been a Democrat her whole life, came from a not particularly political family, but she liked to be informed. She really kind of stood up for people. She was like one of those folks who, who stands up, voted for Obama twice. And then there's this moment in her life when it's just as if she's pushing against the current of white supremacy, of misogyny. What if you just let yourself go? What if you just let go and let yourself flow into this hate? And then because we do have social media, why there's Andrew Tate and Joe Rogan and, and Alex Jones waiting to catch you and carry you, right? Um, there's a chapter in the book on um, the ugliest right-wing movement I've ever encountered. They're not the most powerful, uh, except in as much as they shape so much of it, the MRAs, the men's rights activists. And every other right-wing movement I've ever written about, I go because they're more interesting than the liberal caricature. Um, they may be nastier, but they're more interesting. This is the only one that's dumber than his caricature, and his caricature is dumb. Um, and yet, to my horrible dismay, some of the most vocal people within that movement are the so-called honey badgers. They're the women who have embraced this misogyny too. I mean, misogyny is a disease that afflicts us all as this white supremacy. And um, I think, yes, I think, you know, when we speak of, of youth and the ways in which a lot of young people can a little bit, to borrow a term, code switch, they can sit in my classrooms and teach at Dartmouth College and use really appropriate and progressive and thoughtful language. And then they can click. And here, the click is usually misogyny. Um, mm. Elsewhere, it's race. Um, but uh, waiting for the young to save us, that's not it. They've got to work out. Uh, talk a little bit more about that click, but as you described the undertow, like uh, I, I have, um, uh, I, I, in my, in my undergraduate years did uh, a little bit of uh, religious studies as, as, as well. And one of the things that sort of like, um, uh, came across in some of the, 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 the stuff I did was the allure of orthodoxy, uh, meaning that you wake up in the morning and there's like 80% less questions that you have to deal with. Right. Like, you know, you don't necessarily like I have a limited amount of like foods that I'm allowed to eat. There's certain things that I cannot wear. So I don't have the same sort of like questions that maybe uh, it's like, how am I going to dress? I know what I'm going to be doing at certain times of the day. I know what I'm going to be doing at certain uh, times of the week. Um, there's just a lot of questions that I don't have to answer if I subscribe to some type of, of orthodoxy. Um, I don't have to, and, and, and that's, that's nice when you're dealing with like modernity can be, uh, uh, exhausting and, um, and, and, and the, your, your example of the undertow sort of like feels, or your metaphor there feels a little bit like that. Like this is, yeah. And, and, and so what to, about that click? Is it just sort of like, there's too many like questions and, 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 and uh, you know, the, uh, the the idea of 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 people being non-binary or the idea of trans or the like the sort of meaning that there are no hard and fast rules you can't rely on I think like Jordan Peterson once said like you know part of the problem is is that like if, if you come up I and I can't tell if w what pronouns I should mm -hmm. use and I I can't I, he literally has said like I can't start from my stereotype of who you of what your gender is so i don't know how to address you from the get-go yeah and which is uh, you know from my perspective a little bit demented and twisted anti-social yeah. well <laughs> no, not so much anti-social it's anti whatever those genders are that he had that he like he fits into boxes but we live in a in an era in a society where a lot of the boxes and a lot of the hard fast rules are you know 
sort of like sunk down and you have to do a little bit more work uh, associated with it. It's not necessarily a lot, but it's, it's a little bit more. And that can be exhausting for people. Is that the click you're talking about? I think it is. And it's why, for instance, earlier you said, you know, that number of, you know, the, the, the market decline and the number for whom uh, people say religion is, is very important. In some ways, that's the undertow as well. You know, it's if you're engaged Maybe you go to a big Baptist church. Maybe you go to a Pentecostal church. Maybe you go to a mosque. There, there is still work and community engagement with others, people who uh, are often different ages and so on. And those are not always conservative forces, right? The undertow of Christian nationalism, for instance, is the answers. Most of the people I talk to, none of the Proud Boys are churchgoers. They don't go to church. Um, you know, some of these very vulgar guys, James Schmidt in, um, uh, uh, what was the town, uh, Ashton, uh, uh, Michigan, I encountered really, I mean, I, this is a podcast and I can't repeat some of his misogynist language. Um, and yet his big issue was we need prayer in schools. He doesn't pray. He doesn't go to church, but we need that to happen, right? Because it's a sort of simple answer. And the answer and I think this was true for Ashley Babbitt too, who had not been a particularly religious person, but became a Christian nationalist. The answer is authority, the, the idea of God as authority. And then that allows you to make that switch to a person, a cult of personality. Whoever is the strong man, the one who embodies authority, now it's easy. What do I do? I believe what they tell me what to do. It's why I think, you know, people talk about Trump or DeSantis or any others flip-flopping missing the point. The point is strength. There's not too many issues that Trump couldn't go about 180 degree on that his people wouldn't follow him. I don't think he could come out as anti-gun, um, but he could do a lot. Um, DeSantis, maybe not yet. Maybe he'll get there. Um, I think that undertow, that that pulling you in. And I like you say, this is a time of great change, but tell me, when it wasn't, you know, I, when I look at my classroom at Dartmouth College, um, uh, which was the last of these uh, the, these these uh, overpriced elite schools to uh, um, uh, to go co-ed, you know, uh, I realized that when I was born, uh, none of the women in my classroom would have been there, right? And you can go back one more generation, and um, uh, if there's a kid with a parent of color and a white parent their parents wouldn't have been allowed to uh, uh, marry. And if you go back a little bit further, maybe their grandparent, right? They wouldn't, a woman wouldn't be allowed to vote. This has always been a time of great change. I, 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 I'm not convinced of that. Uh, I'm, well, I, I'm not convinced. I, I'm convinced that there's more change now and there's more access to the awareness of change. I yes. can't remember what book it was that we, uh, I, I think it was, uh, it was John Sides. I can't remember exactly but there was a stat that just astounded me. And this is from a couple of years ago. Um, up until 2008, until after the Obama election, 50% of, of, of white people, non-college educated white people still thought the Republican party was to the left of the Democrats on race. <laughs> and I think that not only like, you know, and really, when you look at the last like 30 years, it really has been the last 30 some odd years, maybe a little bit more where there have been all these changes, but the awareness level of these changes and the implications as to that is presumed as to uh, on whose life it was, you know, like it's directly impacting you. Right. I mean, that I think is like, I think, I think the the technology, the social media really where you you hear this stuff and you can be targeted with this stuff um i i think that is it it, it is raised a level of awareness that people have about stuff that and and being told of uh, also that it's bad um i mean it's amazing to me what trump has been able to do to the republican ideology like you know they, they can barely muster any type of deficit uh hawkery anymore they, they you know they can't really talk about the debt uh, Medicare and Social Security got the whole party to, to like publicly basically say, no, we we, we don't want to cut this. Uh, I mean, and and I, you know, I think he, he could he could reverse himself in, in, in six weeks and it would probably take like a month and a half for everybody to follow him on that. 
there's, there's a chapter, yeah, social media, I think. There's a chapter in the book um, called TikTok, uh, which is a QAnon slogan, uh, about a woman who might call Evelyn in Austin, Texas. And, and um, part of the slow civil war, I think, is maybe listeners have heard every now and then we hear about some, usually a man going crazy with QAnon fever and killing his family. Um, there's actually more of these than we realize. And then beyond that, there's kidnappings and there's assaults like Evelyn's that didn't make national news, barely made local news. Local news didn't even mention the QAnon affiliation. You had to dig deep into what really happened. Young woman in Austin, Texas, kind of a hipster lefty from a conservative family in Waco, Texas, in fact, during the pandemic, locked down, got bored, started doing her own research. And I'm sympathetic to that. There is a democratization of knowledge. I work at a college, I have access to a library. Now Evelyn can start uh, digging in and she looks at numbers. She may not have the means to interpret them. She sees that number, 800,000 children disappeared every year. This number is correct. That's a fact. 99% of them are found within hours. You know, uh, uh, it's a custody dispute or even less than a custody dispute, a babysitter who is late at home. The actual number of abductions is in the hundreds, but you gotta go digging and someone doesn't know that. So Evelyn, she sees that 800,000 number and she goes down the rabbit hole. Preacher in uh, Yuba City, California, I just loved, he was talking about one of the speaker. He's talking about how this guy is so powerful. He goes down rabbit holes, deep rabbit holes. And he's trying to think of like how to say it and he just so he just says it again deep rabbit holes that's evelyn until she comes and she's still emailing all the time uh, and texting with her friends who are lefties about QAnon, and they think they're all having a big joke and they don't realize that evelyn's crossed over and she's no longer joking there the joke is feeding her she becomes convinced that she has to take action she gets in her little red beat up Fierro and she goes looking for child snatchers and ramming into cars that she concludes have abducted children in them. Nobody gets really hurt. Um, Evelyn's life is ruined. Um, a couple people are really terrorized and traumatized. As I say, it makes no news. Um, this is a person who you're right before social media. I don't know that she ever would have gotten to that place. Even if she was subject to paranoia, I don't know that it ever would have been swept up. It's a little bit like Kanye, right? And his anti-Semitism and this debate about whether or not the anti-Semitism pre-existed that. I don't care. It's, it's, it's in the air now, right? It's there available for you. Or like any of the number of so-called lone wolf shooters, there's manifestos, professional hazard I read, each one building on the other. That story, so that like the Buffalo shooter can download the Christchurch shooter's uh, right. manifesto and repeat it and build on it and then frame his like, here, I'm going to get caught, but I'm going to post this online and they're not going to be able to stop it. Here, here's how to do it. And here's how you can build on it. I do think that is different now. And I think you're right. And I think that's why, you know, it's why the penultimate chapter is called the Great Acceleration, which is this right wing term now. It began as a left wing term and, and now is a right wing term. We are in a period of acceleration. Uh, you, you you mentioned uh, that you, you start the book uh, with uh, Belafonte and 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 you you bookend it with uh, Lee Hayes from the Weavers, who was uh, um, uh, they were a sort of a folk group, I guess, and they um, uh, were, were blacklisted at one point. But aside from like the. The, the that that sense of you know um there's a uh like a sisyphusian quality of like you got to keep at it and uh what did, did you come across like any situations where people had sort of like stepped out of that world and what what's your sense of like what needs to happen for those that for that to happen more often i mean you know, I, I think so, so wherever I've written about, so people say, why are you picking on uh, Nevada? Why are you picking on Nebraska? Why are you picking on Wisconsin? Well, I could write about Vermont. And in fact, in a footnote in the book, there is my neighbor, Nazi Ralph. Uh, that's not a figure of speech. Not, uh, Nazi Ralph has got swastikas tattooed on his hands. Um, however, he did have a big swastika on his side um, that um, for the sake of his mother, he had changed. Um, uh, He's still 
a Nazi, but he has changed his views a little bit. Um, uh, he'll talk to me, um, but he's still a Nazi. He says, you're, you know, I'll talk to you. You're half white. I'm half Jewish. So he gives me 50% human in his book. I'm not interested in going to Nazi Ralph and saying, how can I deprogram you? Any more than Nazi Ralph is going to be able to convince me of his racist views. Uh, the folks who are attacking my kid's school district, they're not ignorant folks. They're dark, they're very affluent Dartmouth graduates. Um, and they can't come to me and say, uh, uh, let us explain why uh, allowing your child to be who they are in their school is wrong. They're not going to convince me. They're not going to convert me. Uh, and I'm not going to convert them. I'm not an evangelist. And I think this is another one of the myths of liberalism that we can appeal to a politics of irrationalism with rationalism, a politics that deliberately celebrates and explicitly and openly celebrates myth, the power of myth by saying, well, actually, tell me how many times on Twitter someone actually in you has really worked. It doesn't work. I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is stepping up, building beautiful things, beautiful things that we want to be a part of, um, beautiful things that speak to everyday people, right? And, and you that and I'm a I'm an all hands on deck guy. I don't, you know, I'm not going to tell the end. I'm not going to tell Antifa to stand down, and I'm not going to tell someone who says, "Hey, I'm going to get involved in the race for the Supreme Court in Wisconsin." vitally important right now. I'm going to get involved in electoral stuff to stand down. Um, arts, that's why I begin and end with song, right? That's important too. Um, young people, there are some hopeful young people in this book. Little town of Black River Falls, Wisconsin, after row, drive in. They're on the bridge over the uh, over the, uh, the Black River. This group of young women, queer kids, and uh, holding signs. And my favorite is a cheerleader Peyton, a cheerleader with the Black River Falls Tigers. Um, this is a small town. These are not hipsters. And she's holding a sign that says, I can say this on this show, right? She's sure. holding a sign that says, fuck off. And the fuck off is to you. It's to me. It's to us folks who failed, who let Roe fall, right? The older generation who didn't organize enough, who didn't take the threat seriously enough, who didn't fight hard enough who are handing to her a world in which her possibilities are profoundly circumscribed, right? Um, when I said to these kids, and why have I been talking? People were talking about civil war. I thought they'd be surprised. They were lovely square kids, student body presidents and so on. They're like, yeah, we're ready. Now, what they meant was they were all armed, Wisconsin rural kids. They all knew how to shoot except for their leader was an archer. She was their Katniss, like in Hunger Games. Um, but, and no, it's not Red Dawn for them any more than it is for the militia guys. Um, but I like that their heart is there. And I like that they know that the struggle is there. Um, and that this is not, democracy is not something you have. It's something you have to go do. It's not something you preserve and put in a jar. It's something you have to make that they would be the first to say we haven't fully made yet. Right. Um, that, I think, uh, you know, when you want to talk about younger generation. Those are the folks uh, I look at and, and, and see some hope in. Well, Jeff Charlotte, uh, professor of English, Dartmouth College. The book is The Undertow Scenes from a Slow Civil War. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm and on the podcast and YouTube subscription. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Really fast. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Emma. Really Thank you. It.